Thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then I'll tell you a little bit more about GGV and what we do. And so um, I started um, my career uh, as an undergrad at Rutgers, so Rutgers University in New Jersey. I studied art history and econ. Um, while I was there, I had worked for a credit agency called Moody's who did the credit scores for a lot of the debt and a lot of the bonds that companies would hold um, and countries and sovereign, sovereign um, funds would also have as well. And so I cover specifically consumer goods and retail um, while I was in school. Um, then the market crashed. <laughs> um, and then I went off and um, actually started uh, my career in Teach for America. So I was in, um, uh, I was a core member there, and I taught middle school, uh, private ed, uh, special ed, and general education uh, for middle school students, all subjects, for a couple of years. Then I became a school administrator, um, decided to go back to, I, I got my master's in education, special ed at that time, decided to go back into finance um, and, uh, went to University of Chicago for my MBA. During that time, I discovered a lot more around startups and venture capital, and that summer was when I first started working in VC, and that was about five and a half years ago. So I've been in venture since, um, and I've been with GGV for a long time. I started working at Qiming, which is a venture fund in China, um, one of the first institutional investors in Xiaomi, uh, with Hans Tung, who was there, um, who I was working with, who now is at GGV, who I work alongside very closely with as well, and is a good friend of Professor Dasher's too. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about GGV, GGV is a venture fund that has been around for 18 years. We primarily invest across both US and China, so two markets. Um, we have done this starting from day one. Our first office is in Menlo Park, which is where I am right now, about like 10 minutes from here uh, on Sand Hill Road. Uh, but we also have a Shanghai office and a Beijing office. Uh, we manage um, now about 3.8 billion. We have many portfolio companies uh, and uh, 37 exits in, the, in our portfolio so far, so IPOs and M&As. And um, here are some of our highlighted companies. Alibaba we actually invested in in 2003. So we saw kind of the rise of platforms, right, and how that scaled over time, which was a huge advantage for GGV to see that and be able to spread that knowledge across companies in the US. And so um, we have a lot of platforms on the consumer side, like Wish, OfferUp, um, Airbnb on the travel side, to um, enterprise companies like Square and uh, Slack, we're on the board of, um, and Musical.ly that just exited last year, sold to Total ByteDance. Um, and so we like everything around consumer, around urban tech, mobility, to uh, enterprise, SaaS, and uh, lastly, frontier tech, IoT, robotics. And so what I do specifically is I'm on the investment team, so help with building out our investment thesis, um, sourcing companies, doing diligence for companies, then investing in them, and then personally um, being on the board of companies or um, helping uh, support our portfolio. So I work with 28 companies within GGV's portfolio. I am on the board of two companies, and I'm a, a board observer for 14 of our portfolio, and happy to tell you more about them if we have time. So just to give a quick update, um, specifically around US-China, just given that what we do, um, here are some statistics um, that show kind of the growth of what China has become today. Right? And as you can see, uh, one of the leading factors uh, that uh, China has over the US is uh, one, of course, population, but the rise of smartphone and mobile first users in China. And so um, e commerce transactions um, and e commerce penetration, because they were a mobile first country, and a lot of other countries in Southeast Asia are also following this pattern right, of China. Um, are now uh, you know, a clear leader here. And you can see even uh, penetration-wise for e-commerce is more than double of that in the US. And that trend continues to kind of go, go even faster. Um, mobile payments, for example, is like 10 times bigger in China. Um, obvious, most of you who are from China obviously use WeChat and Alipay and we, WeChat Pay. Um, and 
the most surprising, I think, statistic that people have seen is the number of unicorns that are in China. And so unicorns, we call them as companies that are valued over a billion dollars. And you can see how this has already starting to tilt um, two years ago, uh, I mean, in uh, end of Last year, we had about 98 unicorns in China and close to just a little over 100 in the US. And so this divide has, this gap has really closed in. Um, and China are creating much bigger companies now. Um, and there's a lot of funding involved as well. And so you can see um, that 218 billion in VCPE funding went into China, um, catching up with the US. Um, and we, we believe that will actually surpass um, in the next few years. So um, just to reiterate on that point, like U.S. used to have about 81 percent um, of all VC investments um, and all the dollars going into this innovation, but now that has shifted um, to 54 percent um, in 2016. A lot of that obviously went to China, but a lot of it is also going to emerging markets as well. Just, um, just. To reiterate on this point, um, we as a fund uh, are actually looking into Southeast Asia uh, more broadly. We have done investments in Singapore, like Grab. We're investors in Grab. Um, and so we are looking heavily in Indonesia, in Thailand, in, um, in other, other parts of Southeast Asia for opportunities. Oh, this. Picture didn't show up, but it was really a, a collage of faces uh, from the Forbes Midas list. So this list is comes out every year of like the top 100 investors in the world in venture capital, um, and so. Um, this year was the first year where we saw the number one VC in the world was Neil Shen from Sequoia China. Um, and five years ago, no one from China was even on the Forbes Midas list. And so we saw 16 VCs out of 100 were from China. Um, and a lot of them were actually uh, have ties with firms in the US as well. And so um, GGV has two on there, Hans Tung and Jenny Lee, who's been on there for, for many years now, actually. Um, but we have seen a lot of other, other companies make it as well, especially because the list now is starting to recognize that a lot of the unicorns are coming from China, not just US anymore. And so that needs to be factored in onto the list as well. And so. I um, wanted to get into female entrepreneurs in China um, specifically. And before that, I wanted to start off with a statistic around just the, the number of people in China and the number of graduates in China as well. So um, the most number of graduates, uh, that college graduates um, in the world actually come from India. So 78 million graduates from India uh, last year. Uh, there was 77 from 77 million from China, so one million less, um, and U.S. was actually at 67 million uh, graduates. This was a you can look this up um, on Forbes as well, and this was a statistic that was recently published. Um, within STEM grads specifically, uh, China leads in the in the entire world. China has 4.7 million STEM grads every year in math and science and technology. Uh, India followed by a, a half of that at 2.6. Uh, US is actually only 586,000. Um, and Russia following behind US at 561,000. So I want to go into this framing just like the size of the pool and like um, just giving you some context around um, graduates in general. And so um, this goes through kind of China's female population compared to the US, uh, obviously a little bit skewed because of the one child policy, but um, that is now relaxed. Uh, we have um, actually more female founders in China and, than in the US, and a lot of that is attributed to the fact that they have a lot more STEM grads as well. 4.5% um, female CEOs and um, female executives are particularly high because of the amount of consumer companies and e-commerce co companies in China compared to the U.S. Um, so, you know, Alibaba is skewed much more female than it is uh, male as well, and so a lot of that has been through a lot the females that rose through the ranks um, and what they they are interested in as well. And so, 
here is um, some interesting stat that was published recently about female entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of them actually have um, gone abroad and were Western educated um, and, and come back to China and to do more. And here are the most popular fields where female entrepreneurs tend to thrive in China. Um, we actually invest in uh, a lot um, in these categories in China as well. And so um, in total, uh, the, the female founders in China have raised almost $6 billion since 2013. Um, and here are some notable female entrepreneurs in China as well. So um, Didi is, uh, is one of our portfolio companies, as well as Xiaohongshu, which, you know, um, uh, Charwin is a Stanford alum. Uh, uh, ByteDance uh, and 73 Hours are also our portfolio. So in total, we actually, I counted, we have 13 female um, co-founders or CEOs in our portfolio in China. And we actually only have 10 in the US. So um, that that's a little bit of a background around kind of what, what we're seeing uh, in China as well and, uh, and compared to the US. That's it? Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. no problem. Thanks. Yeah. That's it. Should I do anything? So, uh, yeah, we can uh, kind of let the projector go off. We'll be talking for the rest of the session. Um, so there's two big things. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about China in general. And then I'd like to talk more about the situation of women involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Sure. So we see the amazing statistics what would you say about evaluating potential uh, investments that are in China versus here in the US? Uh, you've got a really international portfolio. Can you use the, basically exactly the same process, or do you have to make some changes? So the way we make decisions is we invest as one fund. So we have a global committee when we look at deals, which is very unique to actually most cross-border funds. Um, so every Monday night, we'll sit together um, and we'll talk about deals on both sides. Uh, it still turns out to be about like 50% of, you know, of the dollars go to US, 50% in China. Um, but the way we look at it is still the same principles around kind of market TAM, market opportunity, right, especially around the team. Um, and so... Kind of detailed question yeah. for the companies in China. Do they all have their materials in English, or do they leave them in Chinese? <laughs> um, they do not, but our internal materials are all in English. OK, OK. Now, I, I ask because I remember some years ago talking to people about companies got better valuations if they could put their materials into English. This was you know, some years ago in China, right? <laughs> And so I'm, I'm, but I'm really seeing just the scale of VC investing going up so much in China. The size of exits looks very similar to the ones that do in the United States. Yeah. Uh, it's really grown up almost like the American system in just an amazingly short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Does that make things difficult for GGV? Are you having more competition for good deals or... Um, are you still able to leverage kind of early mover advantage? I think it's definitely very competitive in China and even more so than the US on deals. Uh, we've seen just valuations creep up way more. There's much more inflated in China than it is here just because of the sheer amount of dollars um, that are in the ecosystem. We also see that um, we also see, you know, the way we look at companies in the U.S. change over time as well, because because we because U.S. is you know a population of about 300 million people, right? And a lot of the companies we invest in, in the U.S. if we want them to really be a big company and be you know uh, more than just a unicorn, they would actually have to be a very global company. And so, for example, GGV invested in Airbnb and has helped Airbnb very closely with China operations and helped mm -hmm. them set up their China office, hire China, um, hire into the China team and set up that strategy. And for Airbnb, it's not about just capturing, you know, other visitors globally going into China, but what they want to do is capture the China outbound tourism um, market 
right? Because as China opens up, more and more people will have more money to go abroad and try new things, and that's where Airbnb can thrive. And so we see this dynamic of like, how can we leverage what we learned in China, our know-how, uh, for our English, uh, for our U.S.-based investments? A lot of the times, China companies are not yet ready to go from China to U.S. Um, but there's a lot more of uh, China uh, U.S. companies wanting to go into China. Does GGV have any kind of standard strategic sort of guidelines? Are you focusing on any particular areas or any particular domain, uh, industry domains? Yeah, so um, more broadly, we focus on three areas. One being consumer internet. So consumer internet is what I focus all my time in. That is e-commerce. Um, that's you know, e-commerce infrastructure, so from like payments perspective to security on that front, um, to social media, digital media, uh, as well as travel, and, um, and also cross-border fits very well into this bucket as well. So anything that um, either has supply chain in China or um, have customers in China or vice versa. Um, so uh, were you directly involved in investing in Grab? Uh, I was not. That was our China team. Okay, okay. Uh, how do you see Southeast Asia? We, we are definitely um, seeing a lot of opportunity there. We don't have anyone on the ground there today. I uh, actually just hired an intern um, that is uh, from Indonesia and will work with us this summer um, about it but um, haven't made that investment yet. Well, one of our uh, partners, Jishun, uh, is very involved in Southeast Asia, especially because he's from Singapore. Jenny is also from Singapore as well. Uh, so we have a lot of ties. OK, before I go on to talk about the other topic, the, the yeah. topic of women, uh, I've got kind of a sort of off the wall question for you. Uh, so 3.5 billion under management at GGV which is a very good, you know, large venture capital firm. What do you think about SoftBank's $93 billion vision <laughs> fund? Do, is that VC or is that really something different? I think it, it's not VC because, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the type of dollars they want to deploy and the yeah. type of ownership they want to have is also quite different. Okay. So we see that as like the new IPO market. <laughs> Okay. Or a new way for early investors to exit, um, and that's exactly what they've been doing okay. as well. So it's really more like exits when they throw a billion dollars at something. Yeah, so well, it depends on like what type of investor you are when you, yeah, okay. you came in. But, um, but what they're doing is a very interesting strategy around um, investing in multiple competitors yeah. um, so that they will merge them together, and that is... Something yeah, that okay. they're, they're keen on doing. Yeah, I keep thinking up things. I was noticing 4,900, give or take, exits in China last year and about 750 in the U.S. Why so many more in China? Any ideas? Or is it just timing or a very active ecosystem? I think it's a very, a very active ecosystem for sure. And just okay. like a lot of aqua hires. Um, and the way that the um, teams... It, the way that BAT invests in China is very different from how Fang operates in yeah. the U.S., right? And so, like, the Baidu, Ali, Tencent of the world, um, and there's a new generation of that as well, but, like, they would actively invest alongside VCs um, and not exert, like, too much control, yeah. but they leverage them quite a bit. And then eventually, um, like you saw recently, the May um you know, the LMA um, exit, right? And so with US, if you are invested by Google or Facebook and et cetera, like they, they tend not to want to do that and people tend yeah. to shy away because they're like, well, then it's a strategic and they'll just, yeah, okay. it'll be hard to exit. Okay, are people familiar with the term aqua hire? Okay, so if what you're really doing is getting the people to come to work for you more than the business that the company is doing, when you acquire the company, you're really acquiring the people, so it's aqua hire. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a, you hear this now. Um, kind of moving on to the discussion of women, the first statistic that you had before you started using the slides about how many women in STEM are graduating from universities, and in the United States, it was like 586,000. Yeah, and it's men and, China, and men and women. 
Okay, oh, that's men and women yeah. graduating in STEM. Okay, but still, in China, 4.7 million graduating. So if you figure that the population of China is about four times as big as that of America, you still have a lot higher percentage of the population involved in STEM in China. Yeah, that's right. Do you think that's going to continue? Do you think that um, this is a temporary kind of thing? Um, I, I think that will continue, especially given how much say the government has in what you study. Yeah, okay, right? um, okay. A lot of like the tests determine what type of major you're going into, right, and um, where you're going to go to school. And so they, I mean, actually from that standpoint, it's been a plus uh -huh. for, for the economy. So let's start with the United States. There are not many women who are in venture capital firms in the U.S., right? There are not. <laughs> and uh, is that situation, what does that feel like on the ground? Do you feel like you're the only woman in a lot of meetings? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pro, actually, um, okay. a lot of times because... Um, you know, we bring something completely different to the table, especially if you invest in certain categories. Uh, for, for me, I invest in consumer, and majority of consumer decisions are made by women in the family, right? Or, um, you know, they just spend a lot more in general. And so when I pitch companies or explain companies to the partnership, it really brings a very different perspective um, that, you know, instead of a partner having to ask their wives or their daughters if they use this certain company or product, uh, we actually have a lot, lot more research. So listening to your background, I feel like you should be about, you know, 55 or 60 years old. Oh, no. Do you have trouble with getting people to take you seriously when you walk into a meeting? Um, <laughs> I look very young. Um, which you know is a good thing too, uh, um, but but I I haven't I've had, I haven't had that issue with entrepreneurs. Okay, okay. Uh, what about other venture capitalists? Because I'm you have to coordinate yes. a lot and you have to syndicate a lot. I, I would say as a female, I have encountered you know certain hardships before, in the, especially in the boardroom. We've had co-invested in a in. A Europe, with a European investor, a board member, who was maybe 70 plus years old, very different, um, and uh, just asked for me not to be there because I was a female. Wow. Okay. <laughs> How did you handle that situation? I mean, I did. I was an observer, so I, yeah, I wasn't okay. actually a board member. Okay. Um, so I ended up working very closely with the CEO instead, outside of the boardroom. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that, that still happens today. And this yeah. happened, like, less than two years ago. Do you sense a difference in the attitudes in China than the attitudes here, either positive in China or negative in China? I think, um, I think women everywhere still has a, a lot of challenges, but I would say that because there's a lot of STEM grads, there's, in China there's a lot of women in finance particularly, so there's actually a lot of women mm -hmm. in MPE, MVC in China mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, if you were talking to a young person who is interested in going into this kind of venture financing, would you have advice for them? Yeah, I think, um, one, be always curious and passionate about learning. So one of the things in venture is that you don't specialize um, the moment you start, right? So a lot of times you're a generalist. So I, when I worked at Flextronics, which is a venture arm of, uh, which, is, which was uh, in their venture arm, I was covering uh, IoT and I was covering security. And it was like a very different field than what I'm doing today, but you have to be able to learn all of that, talk to experts, right? get smart about it, and just read about that type of news all the time. And so being broad and being staying in tune with what you're doing uh, and what you're learning is, is very important. But second of all, it's about, v VC is so much about networking. Yeah. So you have to want to spend your whole day in meetings. <laughs> And like talking to people, talking to entrepreneurs, talking to other VCs, um, other ex, um, ex Google alums, right, or, or or others that come out of the, uh -huh, the companies. Uh -huh. So uh, okay, that's great. Why don't we open the floor to questions? I have a few more rolled up, but let's give people in the audience a chance. 
Go ahead, you first. Quick question. Um, I'm curious, what can you learn in venture that you can't pick up anywhere else? So what is that unique <coughs> skill that you can pick up in venture? Basically? So the question was, what can you pick up in venture capital, right? Oh, yeah, yes. Sir. Yeah, that is really unique that you can't pick up in any other kind of job. A lot of venture is about reading people, right, and the team. So a lot of times, if you have a great idea but a bad team, you, it just will never become big, right? Um, so it's really about um, seeing patterns in people and seeing like how hungry the people are, right? What is the motivation behind them? Uh, why do they want to do the startup? And, and see if they're really in it for the long haul and do they have that tenacity to do it. And so um, I would actually say there's not really that much skill involved in venture other than that because um, one, in the early side, there's nothing for you to model, right? There's, there's, there's just not that many numbers, right? You can guesstimate. Um, on the large later rounds, it's all about the numbers. So that's all you're really doing is can the math make sense? And so I think VC is so much around about people and like making the right bets, but really at the right time. So is that an intuition matter? Is that something where you get a feeling, or how, how do you deal with that at the early stages when you can't model? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it is you and the partner's intuition, but um, learning from, but going back and learning from your mistakes. So we have, we've actually passed uh, on the Series A of Airbnb. Like, that it was very painful, right? And we passed on Uber very early on, and so, you know, being able to go back and say, well, why didn't we invest? What did we do wrong? How can we not make that mistake in the future? Is something that like we actively have to do all the time. Oh, there used to be this really funny website called didnotinvest.com. Oh. <laughs> and it was, you know, all the companies like Google that, you know, people didn't invest in. At the yeah. Beginning. Um, are there a lot of disagreements about investments when I, you get together? Yeah. Because it has to go through a panel, right? Yes. Uh, it depends on the firm. Okay. Depends on the firm, but our firm, yes, it is by vote. Uh, but I, I think you, I'd say like th there will never be a good deal when everyone agrees. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's good to go back and forth um, and really debate around the most controversial companies. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You had a question. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm curious about what type of value. Um, companies are looking for from from VC partners and from your experience on the boards you serve, the, the 28 companies you work with, the CEO you just shared that you work really closely with even though you weren't invited in the board meeting itself, what are they actually looking for? What kind of um, value are they looking for from their VC partner from your experience? With so very briefly the question, and I'm doing this because we're on videotape and they may not be picking you up, uh, <laughs> what are the values that a firm looks at from the VC that they hope to get from the VC through the investment? Yeah, so um, one, I think VC is supposed to be a trusted advisor to the startup. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we provide is just like the, the broader perspective, right? Because as a startup, you're really heads down in the moment with what you're doing all the time. But we actually see, before we meet your invest, the decision to invest in you, we probably saw 10 of you, right? And we continue to see more of that coming up in that same, I'm talking about the same business model, right? Probably same similar idea, similar space. And so we're able to provide like the insights on that front of like, hey, what's happening in the broader market? What are the trends that we're seeing? What, and then second, um, we know how companies scale. And so we see that we anticipate a lot of the problems that you'll run into, right? When do you need to upgrade your team? Right? When should you start getting debt? When, like, how do you think about your next fundraise? Right? And so a lot of that, because we've seen even like, the biggest growth um, globally, we're able to be able to provide that, that help and knowledge right, to our CEOs as well. And so I actually spend a lot of my time um, hiring for a portfolio. So I interview a lot of executives um, that we will bring onto the board, uh, to, onto the executive team for the company. So um, earlier today was uh, interviewing a CMO of one of the public companies who we want to get into our portfolio. Um, and so we do a lot of that as well. 
And so thought leadership and... <coughs> so that's something kind of worth drilling down on a little bit because... And uh, she was female. You know, uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, first of all, this happens a lot, right? You get a lot of people who can grow a company from zero to 30 or 40 people, and then you need a different set of people to grow them to 300. Yes. Um, does the VC have to break the bad news, or how does this work? Well, sometimes uh, it's usually the VC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think because a lot of times, especially founders, your founding team, you've been through so much together, it's really hard to let go. We actually have an instance where this has happened in our is happening in our portfolio right now and really been wanting to have the CEO upgrade his team, right? And that is the number one mistake that all startups have is not being able to fire fast enough and not being able to hire fast enough, right? The right people. Yeah. Yeah. So this person with the public company is a woman, right? You just so is it going to be difficult to get her to come to the portfolio? Compensation-wise, probably, uh -huh. but um, with the right fit, I think it could happen, especially, um, and I think a lot of this is like setting it up in the right way, right, because they might start off as an advisor, right, get close with the company. We might, if we can't get her as a CMO, she might become an independent board member. So there's other ways that hopefully we can, you know. But basically, this is a very mobile population, the executives. They're yeah. willing to jump. Yes. If they have the right incentive package. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, because that's something that we had. I had trouble with. I was w working on a, a big science and technology program for the government of Canada, and when we found the people that we really wanted to bring in and give grants to, um, we couldn't get women to go to Canada, oh. <laughs> which was sort of. You know, a, a difficult outcome for us, and a lot of it had to do with the family situations. But we're asking people to move a long way away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, in these innovation centers, it's a very mobile workforce already. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to ask something about the female, like the leadership kind of things. So, how you handle the kind of to deal with the balance between your, I mean, the family and the business. I mean, there are so many female like us, uh, uh, entrepreneurships right now, but they have to get married and like give birth to their baby. So how do you balance this kind of two things? So the question is really balancing work life, right? How do you balance uh, the biological functions that women have with, uh, you know, a career? Do you sacrifice? Yeah. Um, those problems are real. Like <laughs> we've seen um, some of our execs um, from portfolio companies like leave after giving birth, right, and wanting to become a stay-at-home mom, and we have to respect that. And so, um, I think, I think one one thing in China that actually is a bit more helpful is like that, that there's a lot of family support. Um, actually with, with the mom, the parents, and the in-laws. Um, so uh, even one of our uh, other VPs in China, she recently gave birth. Um, oh, okay, great, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, she, she made a, she's making it work. I mean, it's definitely not easy, but like having family support and, and being like, being sure about your priorities and you, you know, something has to budge, but like, I think we still, we're still very involved. Uh, she's very involved in, at GGV still today. And so um, definitely not an easy task, but I think, I think sometimes, uh, especially in our own startup portfolio, you're the, like some of the females are the first ones to create the policy. So um, I think a lot more people are now open to helping women and, and giving both maternity and paternity leave. Um, and we see that a lot in, in tech and being able to you know, lead, lead that as well. OK. Other, go ahead. How do you think the recent Facebook issues in terms of selling data as a business model will affect the startup and VC ecosystem? So the problems of selling data and uh, the privacy issues, how's that going to affect the uh, sector, right? The industry sector. Yeah, I mean, I think it will 
there will be definitely a lot more scrutiny. I, I can't comment too much on it. Um, but, you know, in Europe, it's way more strict in terms of privacy rules than it is in the U.S. And so perhaps we might lean closer to that, but hard, hard to say right now. And Mark, I don't know if you saw Mark's live stream on Congress today on Facebook. Um, I mean, ironic that it was... Yeah, the broadcast it on, on Facebook, yeah. but uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, if you, if you didn't see it, go back and watch it. I, I saw maybe an hour and a half of it. Um, How much of an issue is that in China? Uh, um, it's actually people are actually very willing to share data in China because they know that they can get something out of it in return, right? And so um, I I think most of the censorship really just comes from the government as opposed to like people acting on it. And I don't know how, what do you think, since you're all from China as well, a lot of you, do you, do you see it being an issue? No, because actually, the, I think that's the difference between, I uh, like the culture difference. So when we was born, like, we are open to a kind of cultural policy kind of thing. So we're not that aware of the privacy of ourselves. So yeah. we're okay. sharing conversations. Okay, good. Let's move to a different question. There you are. Go ahead. For your own experience from the, in the education industry to um, right now investing, so how do you say that? Like, if you interview, looking back right now and um, look at the what the experience bring um, made to you who you are today, and also um, in terms of your own growing, or your own growing, and in terms of the happiness you gain from two experiences. So the question is really about the, your background in the education industry and how did that impact what you're doing now, how you approach your work now, and the kind of personal fulfillment? It's kind of, I feel like everyone right now is going to, for consulting or for investing, and that people will say that this is my passion, but whether it's real passion, like how do I identify, and a lot of people just... I don't know, no one's doing all of this. No one's, everyone's doing all of the money um, kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I I'll get a little bit real about like why I joined Teach for America. So I um, I was born in Hong Kong. Um, I came to the U.S. when I was little um, in elementary school and grew up uh, in Long Island and then in New York and then Jersey, and. Um, I didn't become a U.S. citizen until I was in middle school, and I was actually very, very lucky um, that my parents had brought me into a very good school district in New Jersey, and um, and New Jersey has among the top uh, public schools in the in the U.S. and um, and I actually graduated uh, with uh, a one year one one year of college already done through high school. Um, because I was able to take a lot of these AP courses and a lot of these honors classes, et cetera, right? And that gave me a lot of credits um, to go into college. And I felt like when I learned about what was happening with education in the U.S., I, it just felt very, um, I felt very privileged and I felt um, very lucky, right? And so it was, Teach for America was a way for me to kind of give back, um, give back my time because for someone who's not a U.S. citizen who got even better education than somebody else here, right? I, I felt like I owed a lot to kind of the teachers and, and the people, and so it was like a major reason of why like I ended up doing TFA and actually it turned out great because that's how I met my husband. <laughs> um, but I think it's uh, definitely, I don't think anything else would be more emotionally satisfying, right, than like helping um, a group of students, as, as you know. Um, and, and actually, very interesting statistics, as, as, you, as you saw in the graduates, um, 500 something in the, 500 something thousand in the US, only 30% of US adults um, have a college degree. Um, so just like that was something that I recently discovered just among my my trip across the U.S. Um, and just digging digging deeper into statistics, and so like I, I always think about like how fortunate we are right about that. But in terms of like moving on to the investment side, there's actually a lot of similarities because a lot of the companies that we um, we help fund are helping entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams. Right? And we're helping them grow more alongside them and creating jobs and opportunities, hopefully, for the better and not for the worse. 
Actually, that's a great answer. Go ahead, Isla. Yeah, you obviously see a lot of startup companies in, in Asia and also in the U.S. Is that enough, or do you also are you, you have an interest in Europe? In, 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 in the Nordics, where I come from, there's an explosion of uh, startups these days, and some very interesting companies. So yeah. do you look at Europe as well, and, or are you really focused on, on Asia and the US? We do have a couple of portfolio companies in Europe, but our main focus um, is just US and China, just given our bandwidth. Um, if we don't have a presence in Europe physically, it's hard for us to really be helpful to the entrepreneurs. And I think it doesn't do as much justice to, to the companies there, especially if you know they need the hiring, they need that local network, the, the business development. So that was like a bigger reason of why. It's not that we would never do a European investment, but it would have to be like, we can't be the lead or something. Because I see some of these Nordic companies being very interested in Asia and China in particular. As a, as a market and bringing technology to China. So there seems to be perhaps some opportunities. For sure. Yeah, and there's actually even a lot of bike sharing companies right now um, in Europe, right? And have taken a similar approach to what's happening in China and here. And so, so we see some models, business models, from China going into Europe, as well as a lot of interest of European companies going into China. Let me kind of take that in a slightly different direction. I see a lot of regions in China, uh, especially like Shenzhen, and um, kind of investors in China who would love to attract startup companies from outside China to go and set up shop in China. Does GGV, um, do you, are you pushing for that, or how do, how do you see that trend? You mean pushing our startups to? To do that, yeah. Um, I. I think only when startups are ready, we wouldn't uh -huh. encourage them uh, to go when, when they're not. But we've, we've taken a lot of, um, we do like CEO trips. So we brought a lot of our CEOs last October to China from the US on a tour of multiple cities. Uh, we did that from uh, Chinese CEOs coming here. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do a lot of that cross-pollination. Are you seeing more startup companies that are kind of going global at early stages? Yeah, I think it's a lot easier nowadays than it used uh -huh. to be, um, particularly in consumer. I, I wouldn't say that for enterprise, <laughs> Yeah. Um, just just the nature of that industry, mm -hmm. but like in consumer and e-commerce and, and di like social media, for example, definitely um, like you're the world is your oyster. Like you can, yeah. you can just ship anywhere globally nowadays very easily. Besides the um, kind of uh, difference in platforms, so so much smartphone moving ahead in Asia. Are there other differences in e-commerce behavior between uh, people in Asia and people here? Yeah, I think um, one of the funny thing is I asked the other day uh, because I, I think I was wearing. I must have been wearing a startup t-shirt, um, but uh, I asked like, oh, in China, are people like really loyal to, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, Tencent or Ali and wear, wear clothes that represent them? Because in here, you know, the coveted Google, Google hats, right, or, or that Facebook t-shirt. And, and actually, people were like, we, we, we don't have an affinity. We just want whatever is the most convenient. Whatever is the easiest for me to use, and I will I will just use whatever it is. And so it's kind of funny, like okay. that difference of like. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, you first. How do you get deal flow? Do they come to you, or do you go to them? What 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 is what is the percentage? And then then what metrics do you use to evaluate um, that this is a great company? Yeah. So the sourcing of deals. How many come to you versus how many are you really looking for? Yeah, I, so um, in the past four years, I was I've been at GGV. I've I've seen over fifteen hundred deals at least um, that I've recorded that I had notes on. So um, we look at a lot of companies, and a lot of that, and that's just me alone. Um, and a lot of that is um, inbound for sure. Uh, but we also, uh, and this is fund to fund is different. Uh, we, we do a lot of investment thesis, so we actually look at a sector every six months. We come up with a thesis around like, this is what we want to deep dive into. Here are all the companies in the space. Why do we like the space or not? Can we verify, you know, is this the right opportunity? And so, for example, um, 
I'm looking in health and wellness, right, as a category. And so I would look at what are the drivers of this, this industry, uh, why, why now, right? Like, what is the investment opportunity here? And then I would actually dig up all the companies in this space that would be relevant to my thesis. And then I will seek them out. I actually uh, use LinkedIn probably mm -hmm. more than any other, many, any other social platform. Um, and so I spend a lot of time doing that and a lot of outreach. Um, and the inbound ones may or may not be core to what we're looking at, so we don't always see them. But, um, but yeah, that, that's the general mix, I would say. But everyone is a little bit different because GV tends to lead a lot of deals, right? We don't, we don't get shared deal flow as much, except for some earlier funds, right? Because we're not going to be brought in to, hey, do you want to deal, do this deal with us? It's more like, hey, does GGB want to lead this deal, right? So. So uh, with like 1,500 deals and out of these now, you're working with 28 companies. Yeah. So that's a pretty severe ratio. Yeah. Uh, what are the kind of the really big key thing that maybe especially entrepreneurs would miss? Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things for us is like, just how global and how big is that opportunity? And if it's not a global opportunity, we probably won't invest. No. Just, just given the nature of our fund, just seeing what we see between US and China, and if the, the team does not have that ambition, it's very hard to change the CEO. And that doesn't mean that it won't be a good outcome, right? Like, yeah. we, I met this company who, you know, the CEO was probably gonna pocket $100 million. Like, that's great for them. They should, they should do that and not raise. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, you, you're next. Thank you for this. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the, the global microcosms of the VC communities coming, you know, in Southeast Asia, in Asia, in Europe. So there are, you know, microcosms of VCs in every single continent and place. And there's a lot of mushrooming of micro VCs and accelerators and, you know, and all of that. The ecosystem has grown rapidly. So when we're talking about US, China, and US, Asia, it sort of seems like we are in this microcosm of US. And uh, you know, what other than money can a venture capital really provide? Because the bridge between these two continents, it's just such a, uh, you know, it's all sort of so isolated now. Like you said, if you're not in Europe, you're not doing justice to the uh, startup ecosystem there. If you're not in Southeast Asia, you you are hiring an intern there. That still seems a little difficult, even though you have some members that are from there, but are probably based here. Yeah, so, I think your comment is getting to be very broad and ranging, OK? So I'd like to pick one part of that to start with. And that is that venture capital has really grown drastically in certain rather small kind of regional innovation systems, right, microcosms. And I think that uh, one kind of sort of obvious question is, are they sophisticated or are they really kind of dangerous because they don't know what they're doing yet? Um, hard, hard, hard for me to comment on that, actually. Yeah. But um, I, think, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of funds in those areas, like Sequoia India, right, um, who have the lessons of some other uh, other regions, right, to be able to bring back. One of the things that you know we bring value-wise um, to that region is um, <clears throat> one um, lessons of models and business models that have worked in the U.S. and like can that be transferable there and lessons learned. And then with the China piece, also the same way. But a lot of the startups there actually um, hire a lot of Chinese talent and Chinese people who come from China and go into the U.S into Southeast Asia or want to do business from Southeast Asia to China. And so we see a lot of that flow. And so I think from that standpoint, it is So helpful. it's really a rapid rise in the sophistication of the venture capital community. And a lot of it is because people are going and helping others to see the lessons. Yeah, and I think it just, it, you still need some time to see yeah. like bigger funds to be able to do larger rounds. Because you, there hasn't, you need to see those bigger exits in order for that to happen, and so you're still you're still waiting for that. I but think. it is amazing to me to see how quickly it's grown. Yes. Especially in terms of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. 
somewhat related to a location question. I wonder how important is it a specific location of a company within the country for you to invest, let's say, does the company need to be in Silicon Valley or in Beijing or Shanghai? Or you're really not, that factor is not important? Um, it doesn't ha so we have a lot of portfolio companies across the U.S. Uh, so, for example, we have a lot. Of, we have fourteen portfolio companies in New York. We have a company in Austin. We have a company in Denver, right? We have a company in Seattle and, L and companies in LA. And so, they don't they don't actually have to be in the Valley. We travel to them as well. Um, Are you starting to see more uh, interesting companies in the tier two and tier three cities in China? Uh, or are they all going to Shanghai and Beijing and, and so Hangzhou? Still concentrating and, in, yeah. in the mega cities, but uh -huh. targeting. Yeah. Um, two or two For or their two. business. Yes. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, because you have invested in Indonesia for the grab, uh, what are the opportunities that you see in Indonesia for five or ten years ahead as you are a venture capitalist? So the question is opportunities for five or ten years ahead, great success five or ten years from now in Indonesia, things that you as a venture capitalist you would be especially interested in. So for us, it's a lot around like commerce and payments, for sure. Uh, we think that being a mobile-first economy uh, has very much similar ties to how China has grown from from its rise with that. And so, if um, you know, if, if political unrest is not there and everything is okay in, in five to ten years, I think that there's definitely a lot of opportunity to see new innovation around. Um, even like Gojek, for example, is going into payments, right, and doing a lot more. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a lot of innovation around commerce and, and consumption. If you think about it, like e-commerce penetration in the whole wide world is less than 20%. And so of all retail, right? And so it's all, that number is only going to go up over time. And that is why we are big believers in, in continue to invest in e-commerce, because we don't think that Amazon or Ali is going to capture all of that opportunity everywhere. Great. You had a question. What is, your, uh, what is your take on Indian market? As I mean, India is going at a very good growth rate, and it's a it's a uh, sort of a growing period. So, are you keen on investing in India? Yeah. Are is GGV investing in India? Was that that was right? Your question. We've looked very closely at India for a number of years. Uh, we are not currently investing in India right now. I think um, I think. Market perspective uh, is still a bit, uh, still a bit underdeveloped, and a lot of it is is just like GDP per capita and um, more uh, the rise of like the middle class needs to come up a little bit more before we see more opportunities. Actually, Hans, one of our partners, was um, angel investor in Flipkart and Snapdeal in, in India, and so we've we've been very close with India for for a long time, and we just haven't been able to make an investment yet. Okay, other questions? If we're about getting to the end of the questions, I think we've got some refreshments outside, and we can all have a more informal conversation at that point. I want to thank you, Robin, for giving us a really candid and great insider view of what this world is like, especially, you know, what's happening with this, the role of women in an industry where they haven't had a great, you know, much presence in the United States. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.